that when we come out of this deep recession, it may take some time to reach the stage where we went in. We will not be coming out at the stage where we went in. And it's going to take a long climb to get back to that stage. Those are the realities of the new norm. The World Bank gave support to trade unions which developed their craft in industrial or knowledge-based societies and economies, and whose commitment was to a policy of inclusiveness, partnership, and social dialogue espoused by its sister organization, the International Labour Organization. Now, such trade unions will be branded as responsible as supporters of the Washington Consensus and as betrayers of the role assigned to trade unions by some elements who have cast trade unions into the role as the tools to destroy the Western ethos, presumably to herald a new reality controlled by pan-Slavic, Muslim, Hindu, Confucian, or some other realities. So we turn our back to Western civilization and we embrace the ones with whom we have built no commonality over our lives. I'm, I'm concerned about the expansion of China. When I did my development of civilization at the University of the West Indies and the giants like the Keith Hunt, with a free degree. And we had to study these various civilizations. With a free degree. Correct me, sir, but I don't remember we talked about God in the context of China. I remember talking about Confucius. So we're going to have a world dominated by Confucius. But the world we have today and fallen is one where there was God. It's a strange thing that we're not even discussing. We are embracing the Muslims, the Hindus. We talk about the BRICS country, the ones that will take over the world. And we're not studying what that would mean if such a thing happens. I want people to understand very clearly. I stand within Western civilization, and I stand for Western civilization. And I really hope that you can clap with me for that. My first assumption is that a leader can be considered as one who has a vision of the future, and who has the skill and the will to rally those he would wish to lead in pursuit of that vision. I'm really not caught up too much in discussions about the traits of good leaders and types of leadership. I define a leader. I'm very clear in my mind that a leader has to have a vision of the future. And that vision has to be sustainable. And he has to have the skill and they will to rally followers because there is no leader without followers. And then we need to assess the extent, and that will be done by history, believe me. History will determine whether your claim to be a leader will be a just claim or not. My second assumption is that we all agree that one of the most universal of all human characteristics is that of bonding together with those who are nearest and dearest to ourselves in order to provide security and protect our communal and joint interests. The need for security and for community along with the needs of clarity about our future, the need for authority, and the need for respect are the most critical of universal human needs. And they can be found in any human association gathering across the world. Africans, Chinese, whatever, you'll find that these needs are paramount and universal human needs. It's my assumption that at critical times in the life of a nation, we have to focus 
on these universal needs. My third assumption is that we have reached the stage of our national development where, because of the educational levels we have achieved, we can move from mere polite conversations to robust conversations grounded in intellectual rigor, which has truth rather than pretense and appearances as its main aim. As you look at it, you know the difficulty that Belize was in recently. Sink it. Still under. Grenada is now going into a program. And we hope to hear from the Prime Minister what the terms of that program will be. You know that Trinidad went into a program. People don't remember that Britain went into an MF program. People don't remember that United States went into an MF program because they tend to think it's a program only for poor persons and poor countries. They can all go in there. But I can think nobody wants to go there. I know Barbados don't want to go there. But not going there will mean sacrifice. And it means that that has to be done as a nation. But I turn back to Jamaica. The Jamaican model, as you know, the bifocal model, <coughs> two political parties, two trade unions, whenever, whenever one group won, they overturned the policies of the other. And therefore, poor Jamaica went through the toxic turvy that that meant. And they have no change. They tried to establish a national center under the Joint Trade Union Research and Development Center. They have worked very hard to bring that together. And you would have heard also that Jamaica has now signed on to a productivity arrangement with the help of our productivity council and John Pilgrim and others. So Jamaica is making that change. And I presume that the further they go in that change, the more they will have common ground to fight the IMF, in the sense that they want to get out of that institution. The industrial relations in the Caribbean has been guided by the new term, the new normal, or the new norm, since the 1990s, not from 2007 or 2008. There has been a new normal in industrial relations since the 1990s. And I posit that any person who is keen to lead in the face of this new normal has to acknowledge the new realities, decide if they are suited to lead in these new realities, and be courageous enough to make the required decisions. The new normal was ushered in by a number of circumstances which came together in the 1990s. First of all, the World Bank's decision in 1995 to support the role of trade unions in economic development, provided that they were able to adapt and conform to new realities, was a fundamental shift from the notion of classical economists who saw the union as an interference with business and a monopoly which tended to cause economic dysfunction, dislocation, and stagnation. For those of us who are students of history, this was a significant supportive platform for trade union leaders to grasp and to walk on into the future. After all, most of us, my generation, were aware of the difficult 1970s and 1980s some people call those lost generations, where all over the world, labor and capital seem to have been so embroiled in industrial warfare that a scorched earth policy seems to have been treasured. For those who don't recall the situation to which I refer, let us recall the clash in Britain between Margaret Thatcher, the monitors, the supply siders, versus the radical miners leading to the winter of discontent and the eventual overturning of the British variant of socialism 
and the destruction of the former social compact in Britain. And that new socialism in Britain was based on almost outright nationalization of every business sector. That was returned by Thatcher. Blair never challenged it and cannot challenge it. And that is the new norm for Britain. Can't change it from there. You will also recall Reagan's dismantling of the strike by the air traffic controllers and what it meant to public sector trade unionism. In the Caribbean, the most poignant memory is that of the radical revolutionary movement in Trinidad and Tobago versus the reformist programs of the late Dr. Eric Williams and the virtual civil war. You remember when the Coast Guard attacked the, the barracks and Trinidad was virtually in a civil war situation. They had to get um, troops from Venezuela, troops from the United States of America to bring peace in Trinidad and the Bay. And of course that then um, meant that the whole industrial relations climate of Trinidad had to be changed and cemented in law.